would like to introduce Mr. Manuel Caballero from the Air Transport Bureau. My name is Manuel Caballero, and I am an Environment Officer at the ICAO Secretariat. Uh, and I am here today to talk about one of the many uh, interesting environmental topics that will be discussed at this assembly. Uh, we are going to talk about a global market-based measure scheme for international aviation. Okay, so allow me to start by um, presenting an outline of uh, my presentation today, which will take around 20 minutes and will be followed by a question and answer session. First, we are going to talk about the why. Why is this topic being discussed in this assembly? We are going to look into the process that has led to the current state of affairs. And then we are going to move to discuss the key design and implementation features of the global MBM scheme. Last but not least, we are going to talk about the capacity building and technical assistance requirements arising from the implementation of a global MBM scheme. So let's start from the beginning. The discussion on a global MDM scheme uh, has uh, gone on for quite some time, but one may say that the turning point was the last assembly in 2013, where the assembly made a decision to develop a global MDM scheme for international aviation. The reason to do that was that, as you know, there is a basket of mitigation measures to reduce CO2 emissions from international aviation. And at the assembly in 2013, there was wide recognition that the improvements uh, in the implementation of that basket of measures would not be enough to meet the uh, ICAO global aspirational goal of carbon neutral growth in 2020. Therefore, um, a global market-based measure scheme was uh, considered as a complementary measure that would allow member states to achieve um, this goal and fill the so-called um, emissions gap. So the resolution A3818, which addresses this issue, requested the Council to undertake a number of activities uh, in order to increase knowledge uh, on the main features of a global MBM scheme, both its design and its applicability with the objective of reporting on the results of this work um, precisely at this assembly. So in this slide, we have a brief overview of how the process looks like in the last three years. After last assembly, there was an um, environment advisory group that was established by the council. This group uh, held 15 meetings in a period of slightly less than two years and uh, finished uh, its discussions in January 2016. Uh, the Environment Advisory Group undertook a series of analyses and also uh, provided a draft assembly resolution text on this topic. So this text uh, was uh, taken, um, discussed, improved, further elaborated through a series of meetings that have taken place this year, starting with a, a high-level group which held two meetings in February and April, and then a high-level meeting that took place in May. In parallel to this more formal negotiation process, there were two rounds of seminars, the so-called Global Aviation Dialogues, that took place in 2015 and 2016. The objective of these seminars was to create a less formal uh, environment for member states and experts to exchange views and um, exchange information on the main um, issues of, about this topic. So going back to um, the high-level meeting in May, after that meeting, there were a series of bilateral and multilateral consultations that took place uh, during the summer. And at the end of August, there was a Friends of the President meeting, which let's say, uh, was organized to take stock of these uh, discussions. And the results of this Friends of the President meeting were presented to the Council. 
and the council uh, agreed on a text of a draft assembly resolution on the topic which was included in assembly working paper 52 which will be discussed uh, in this meeting in this assembly so the result of this process that we have very briefly uh, looked at is that um, the uh, global NBM scheme for international aviation is uh, defined as CORSIA, which is an acronym which stands for Carbon Offsetting and Reduction Scheme for International Aviation. In the slide, uh, you can see the main design and implementation features of the CORSIA as they are defined in the draft assembly resolution text including in, included in assembly working paper 52. So from now on, we are going to go through each of these items and please bear with me that what we are going to do is to explain the scheme, to explain the Corsia, the way it looks, it looks like in this draft assembly resolution text. So let's start with the first design feature, which is the phased implementation. The Corsia is um, defined as a scheme that will be implemented uh, throughout three phases. There is a pilot phase that is scheduled to run from 2021 to 2023, followed by a, a first phase also with a duration of three years, therefore from 2024 to 2026, and then uh, a second phase that will run from 2027 to 2035. An interesting aspect of this um, schedule of phases is that each of them has a duration of either three years or a multiple of three years. And this allows the phases to be aligned with the compliance, uh, the compliance periods, which also have a duration of three years. From the point of view of the implementation of the scheme, this is a very important feature. So once we have defined the phases, we have to uh, look at how and when member states participate in the scheme. So Corsia uh, establishes that for the pilot and first uh, phases, uh, participation will take place on a voluntary basis. This is very much in line with the spirit of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCCC, and its Paris Agreement, where, as you know, countries establish their mitigation uh, objectives on a voluntary basis under their nationally determined contributions. For the second phase of the scheme, the Corsia establishes that participation will be um, for all states except for exempted states. And in the next slide, we'll get into details on what uh, these exemptions imply. It is important to note that the ICAO Secretariat uh, in its website provides updated information on the status of um, declaration of uh, intention of voluntarily participating in the scheme. So as of today, for example, we have uh, notifications from 59 states with a coverage in terms of international aviation activity of uh, more than 81%. Let's move to the next design feature, which is, as I have said before, that of exemptions. The Corsia defines um, a number of exemptions uh, for states uh, to participate in the scheme. Some of these exemptions are based on socioeconomic criteria. And uh, according to this, there are three groups of states which are exempted from the Corsia. Least developed, develop, least developed countries, small island developing states, and landlocked uh, developing countries. In addition, the Corsia also establishes exemptions for those states with a low level of international aviation activity, defined in terms of an individual or aggregate share of revenue tone kilometers, RTKs, as per a reference year of 2018. That being said, it is important that the draft assembly resolution um, encourages uh, exempted states, as well as those states whose participation is due in the second phase, to voluntarily join the scheme from its outset, meaning from its pilot phase. And as I said before, in uh, our website, we have information on those states who have already done so. And among those states, one can find uh, exempted states. So another interesting design feature of the uh, Corsia is um, 
the so-called root-based approach to define the coverage of the scheme. Basically, what this uh, approach says is that for those international routes linking states, both of which are included in the scheme, then the emissions from flights flying in those routes will be included in the scheme. And in the same way, uh, when a route links states, both of which or one of which is not included in the scheme, then that route will not be uh, included in the scheme. This can be uh, seen with an example. Let's assume that we have four states. Two of them, the ones without the shading on the top uh, half of the graph, are voluntarily participating in the Corsia. And the uh, bottom two, the ones shaded in gray, are not participating in the scheme. According to the route-based approach, the routes between the two states participating in the scheme would be included in it. Um, the routes between the states participating in the scheme and the ones not participating in the scheme would not be included in the scheme. And of course, routes between the two states which are not participating in the scheme would also not be included in the scheme. But what happens if the following year, one of the two states initially not participating in the scheme decides to voluntarily participate? This is the um, scenario that we have in the following slide. Well, the approach remains the same, but of course, the routes that are included in the Corsia are now slightly more. Again, those li uh, routes linking states participating in the Corsia are included in the scheme and the routes between the states participating in the Corsia and the state which still is not participating in the Corsia are excluded from the scheme. So we can now move to another interesting design feature, which is the distribution of offsetting requirements. And here uh, we need to look into uh, how um, those offsetting requirements are going to be calculated. The starting point is the definition of a baseline for emissions. The way uh, Corsia defines that baseline is making reference to emissions from international aviation as an average of the 2019 and 2020 values. The question is that, um, as we have said before, for a given year, not all states and not all routes are included in the scheme. So for the purpose of calculation of the baseline, we also have to take into account this coverage. Therefore, from the emissions in years 2019 and 2020, we have to deduct those emissions coming from states and routes not participating in the Corsia. That will allow us to define the baseline for the calculation of the offsetting requirements in a given year. So once we have seen how the baseline is calculated, we can now move to uh, the calculation of the offsetting uh, requirements. We have the baseline as a reference, which has been calculated in line with what we have seen in the previous slide. And we have the emissions for the year when the calculation is being made. But again, we do not have to take into account all the emissions from international aviation in that year. We have to deduct those emissions from states and routes not included in the course. Therefore, the amount of emissions to be offset will be the difference between what we see as the orange bar and the baseline emissions that we see as the blue bar. That will be the amount to be offset in year X of implementation of the Corsia. Another interesting aspect, which is somehow a um, complex design feature of the Corsia, is what um, we have heard many times of the dynamic approach for the implementation of the scheme. And this has to do with the um, um, different approaches uh, for the calculation of the uh, growth factor uh, when it comes to emissions. We have heard about the 100% sectoral approach, we have heard about the 100% individual approach, and also about the dynamic uh, approach. Uh, before seeing how Corsia addresses this issue, uh, let's see an example to understand the different uh, uh, approaches. Uh, in this example, for the sake of simplicity, we assume that there are only two uh, operators participating in the scheme, operator A and operator B. 
And also for the sake of simplicity, we assume that their emissions in the reference years of 2019 and 2020 are the same, and they yield the same average, 100 per each operator. Therefore, the baseline for the calculation of offsetting requirements is set at 200. We see that in year X of implementation of the Corsia, operator A has an increase of emissions of 25%, whereas operator B has an increase of 5%. Then, if we apply a 100% individual approach, what we mean is that each operator would be responsible for the offsetting of its respective emissions. Therefore, the uh, offsetting requirements for operator A would be 25 units, and those for operator B would be 5 units. What happens if we apply the um, sectoral approach? What we are doing is to apply an emissions growth factor which is not applied at an individual level, but at a sector-wide level. If we apply such a factor, then we see that operator A has offsetting requirements which are slightly less than those he would have under the 100% individual approach. And similarly, for operator B, the offsetting requirements under a 100% sectoral approach increase uh, compared to those uh, under a 100% individual approach. Now, how does Corsia address this issue of the 100% sectoral, 100% individual? Well, as I, as I have said before, Corsia applies a so-called dynamic approach. It starts with application of a 100% sectoral approach in the period from 2021 to 2029, meaning pilot phase, first phase, and first compliance period of the second phase. And after that, from 2030, it moves not into a 100% individual approach, but into a progressively individual uh, approach with percentages of the individual uh, rate, which are set at 20% for the period of 2030 to 2032, and 80%, sorry, 70% for the period of 2033 to 2035. To finalize this uh, discussion on the calculation of offsetting requirements, it's important to note that the Corsia suggests that for the pilot uh, implementation phase, states have two options for their operator's calculation of offsetting requirements. They can take as a reference the emissions in the year when the calculation is being made, meaning 2021, 22, or 23, but they can also refer back to the emissions level of year 2020. This is uh, something that only applies for the pilot phase. From 2024, operators will have to take as a reference always their emissions in the year when the calculation is being made. Let's move now to the so-called review mechanism. In the graph where we have shown the phased implementation of the Corsia, I have made reference to uh, reviews that happen periodically every three years. These reviews uh, have as an objective the um, assessment of the implementation of the Corsia with a view to suggest possible improvements to the scheme. It is important to note that the reviews are set in the second year of each compliance period. That allows for sufficient time for the recommendations of the review to be adopted and implemented in the next compliance cycle. In addition to the periodic reviews, there is also a so-called special review uh, set in 2032. The target or the, or the objective of that special review will be to assess the need to extend the Corsia beyond 2035. And if that is so decided, then see which possible improvements can be made. Of course, another possible outcome of the special review in 2030 Two is to conclude that um, the MBM scheme, the Corsia, is not necessary, necessary beyond 2035. As we have said at the beginning of the presentation, the, MBM, the global MBM scheme is defined as a complementary measure to fill the so-called emissions gap. If in 2032 uh, it is decided that this complementary measure were not needed anymore, then the scheme would finalize in 2035. Let's move now um, to the implementation features of the Corsia. And as you can see on the screen, there are basically three elements. We have 
the establishment of a monitoring, reporting, and verification system, the emissions units criteria used for the offset of um, CO2 emissions, and registries. The current draft assembly resolution text uh, asks the Council to develop with the technical contribution of CAEP, CAEP, which is the Committee on Aviation Environmental Protection, standards and recommended practices, as well as guidance material for the implementation of the MRV system and the EUC. And in addition, it also requests the Council to develop policies and related guidance material to ensure the establishment of uh, registries. All these uh, materials have to be ready for adoption by the Council in 2018. Why is that? Well, if the Corsia is scheduled to start in 2021, then it is very important that MRV systems start being developed as of 1st of January 2019. And similarly, it is also necessary that a consolidated uh, registry is established by 1st of January 2021. Regarding the MRV systems, it is very important to note that all states whose operators have international aviation activity need to develop an MRV system, not only those states that are participating in the course. Yeah. As I have said at the beginning of my presentation, there are a series of capacity building and technical assistance needs that will arise from the implementation of the course. Yeah not only from 2021, when the scheme is implemented, but also, as we have seen in the previous slide, on the way to 2021, due to the different preparatory work that has to be done by member states. So there is um, an ongoing discussion on the establishment of a comprehensive framework for capacity building and technical assistance for all member states which require such assistance. But of course, with a special focus on those states who will participate in the scheme from its very beginning in 2021. Those of you who had the opportunity of participating in IWAF yesterday heard that there were a number of announcements related to cooperation between ICAO and different partners. We heard, for example, the uh, announcement of a second phase of an ongoing project by the European Union. We also heard an announcement from the World Bank to establish a partnership um, with ICAO uh, to support implementation of the uh, global MBM scheme. And we also heard um, the government of Germany um, offering the uh, possibility of implementing a pilot uh, project on MRV. It is important, of course, that uh, there is a coordination and integration between these activities and additional activities that may uh, come up even in the next few days. So with this, I would like to finish my presentation. Uh, but before that, I would like to um, remind you that there is uh, plenty of information on this topic available in our website. Uh, one of the features of uh, the website is a section on frequently asked questions, where you can see uh, very detailed information on the several aspects that this presentation has covered. And I would also like to remind you that there is an um, ICAO environment booth uh, set up somewhere outside this room where uh, there will always be uh, ICAO secretariat staff who will be happy to discuss with you anything related to this and other environment related topics. So with this, I will finish my presentation. I would like to thank you very much for your attention and I am here for any question or comments you may want to share with us. Thank you very much.